In this vista, we release the player from the confines of the subterranean world and thrust them into a vast open space on a scale rarely seen in our previous games. The narrative takes advantage of this scale as well. With our allies at close range and our enemy is on the distant bridge, we are reminded of the personal stakes and the larger threat, all in one short scene. We tried several different ways of showing the advisor traveling with the Combine forces. We started off with an advisor pod flying over the troops, much as they flew from the Citadel at the end of Episode 1. However, we didn't want to give the impression that those pods were anything but emergency escape units. They were not meant to be self-powered flying crafts that could be piloted around in future episodes. We ended up with the solution you see here. APCs are pulling a structure holding an inert advisor pod. This lets the player study the advisors at different points in their life cycle. They see the main stages of the advisor's metamorphosis, from harmless larvae into powerful and highly mobile monsters. Sometimes very small changes can make a big difference. Originally, these troops all marched in lockstep, using the same walk animation. This looked extremely robotic. We took a second walk animation that had been done for this troop skeleton, a more upright, casual walk, and programmed each soldier to randomly blend between the two walk cycles as he crossed the bridge. This 30-minute change made a huge difference in the scene. Most of our dramatic scenes are constrained in such a way that the player can't progress until the scene is over. For example, there might be a gate that only Alex or a Vortigaunt can open. In this scene, where the Vortigaunt and Alex first see the Combine marching on White Forest, we simply placed a few barrels to block the way while Alex and the Vortigaunt speak. With just this slight impediment, every playtester stayed and watched the scene as intended, so no explicit gate was needed. Alex's model underwent some upgrades for episode 2. We added two new holes to her jacket, courtesy of a hunter, and dirtied her texture up a bit to show wear and tear. We also increased her polygon count, and to help with her jacket, we added shoulder blades to her back so that it flexes better when she lifts her arms. Additionally, we reconnected her belt so that instead of being rigidly attached, it now flexes and slides around more. A lot of this stuff you won't even notice, it'll just look right. Yeah, that's Alex. She's wearing a jacket. You won't even think about it. It's easy to have the computer draw something stiff and awkward, but doing that pulls you out of the game. You stop believing in the characters. They just become icons. Our goal is to make our characters simply look natural, but to do that requires lots and lots of work and tons of new technology. The irony is, if we've done our job, you won't even notice. It'll just look right. Initially, we built this area around the sand traps mechanic from Half-Life 2, warning the player that stepping on sand would trigger swarms of antlions. Soon after the warning, however, the safe islands of rock ran out and the player was forced to run across the sand as quickly as possible. Players were confused by this and upset because Alex and the Vortigaunt would simply say they had no choice and head straight across the sand. To solve this, we decided to stage the combat with safe zones around thumpers instead. This vista is one of the largest open outdoor areas we've tackled in our games. When rendering such an area in real time, it's necessary to use various level of detail techniques made available to us by the Source Engine. For example, the distant foliage and combine enemies are rendered with far fewer polygons than they would be if they were meant to be viewed up close. Additionally, the organic shapes used to model the rocky outcroppings and valley floor below use complex shading operations to combine a relatively modest amount of texture data. This trade-off, which requires a manageable amount of texture data, allows us to use more polygons, enabling us to represent more organic shapes which are in contrast to the orthogonal forms common to our traditional urban environments. Early in the development for this level, we used an animation for Alex that showed her as clearly injured as she ran along behind the player. This really slowed her down, however, and play testers did not enjoy waiting for her to catch up or going back to retrieve her. To address this, we started a recovery in the preceding map to make sure she was healthy enough to run at a regular speed before reaching this area. This scenario required significant changes to the antlion guard behavior. Players of past games were used to dealing with only one guard in a confined space and without anywhere to hide. In this scenario, the player had a safe zone but couldn't remain there to accomplish their goals. One change we made to the guards was in altering how they throw objects at the player. 
Originally, they shoved objects directly toward the player at high speeds. These objects were really hard to dodge, and if you weren't paying complete attention, you could easily be blindsided and killed. The guards now hurl objects along an arcing trajectory, which not only gives the player a greater opportunity to dodge, but looks awesome. The player gets to see the guard launch a car from 100 feet away, then step aside just as it crashes to the ground where they were standing. Some testers had trouble realizing when they were doing damage to the antlion guards, so we've added a bleeding effect that grows more serious as the guards hit points decline. This kind of visual feedback makes more intuitive sense to the players. It suits the biological nature of the creature and frees us from having to rely upon spoken explanations of gameplay. We wanted to create a tension between Gordon and the Antlion Guardians that would develop over several levels and only resolve out here in the open. In order to differentiate this Guardian from the others the player had encountered throughout Half-Life 2 in Episode 1, we changed his texture to a glowing green. This gave the player the satisfaction of revenging himself on the creature that had chased him through the underground lair. For attentive players, this is the first time we've allowed a glimpse of the G-Man since Half-Life 2. In Episode 1, we suppressed the G-Man's visitations completely, to show that he had lost track of Gordon. But after Alex's healing incident earlier in Episode 2, he is actively watching again. Keep an eye out for him. In Episode 1, Alex climbs up into a hidden room and uses a combined sniper rifle to assist the player. The player never sees the rifle, only the targeting beam. For Episode 2, we decided to show the Combine Sniper Rifle and let the player know exactly where Alex would be standing when she used it. However, making it visible and accessible to the player required us to come up with a way to make the rifle usable only with the Vortigaunt's help. Though it's somewhat of a contrived and arbitrary device if for keeping the, the player from using the gun, we felt it was a worthwhile trade-off, given that playtesters tended to enjoy the co-op sequence of Alex assisting them from above. The ambient sound of the poison zombie breathing was placed here to make the descent into the building scary. Although most of the team thought it was comical, there were a few playtesters visibly unnerved by it. One playtester stood at the opening to this room for a long time, afraid to go in. Hey, we got the rifle charged up. Training players who haven't played previous episodes is always a challenge. Those who had not played episode one did not immediately understand that the combine sniper beam was friendly. They avoided it, thinking it could damage them. Therefore, we added this staircase scenario, where we reintroduce Alex's sniper behavior and make a show out of her shooting a zombie to protect the player. This is an instance where observing playtests gave us ideas for tuning the experience. In an early version, playtesters would trigger the lights to go out and the zombies to wake up. Then, they would run out of the room and close the door. After seeing this repeatedly, we added a trigger allowing the zombies to open the door and chase the player. In this scene, we rigged an entity called a physics explosion to create movement among the boxes inside the dumpster. One playtester we had threw a grenade into the dumpster, and the physics explosion entity caused the grenade to fly back out. The player was surprised, thinking the zombie had tossed back his grenade. Although this happened by accident the first time, we went ahead and set up the entities to make sure it would happen for every player who lobs a grenade into the dumpster. Earlier in this level, we blocked the path with fire and forced the player to turn off the gas jet to continue. Fire traps of this sort were plentiful in Half-Life 2, but we could not count on players knowing or remembering how to use them here. Having offered some brief training, we now build on the mechanic by having the player work with Alex to create a cooperative fire trap. Most players turn on the gas, at which point Alex shoots a zombie on the stairs to create the wall of fire. This triggers a parade of zombies to come out of the door below and walk into the fire. Saw blades were a prominent weapon in Half-Life 2, and we wanted the player to recognize them as part of their arsenal in the upcoming warehouse battle. After watching several playtesters ignore them completely, we decided to add the zombie pin to the wall. Most players pull out the saw blade and instantly realize its potential for destruction. After that, they tend to find and use saw blades without further prompting. The battle in the warehouse was created fairly late in the development of this map when we realized that the level had a steady stream of combat, but no real climax. We wanted to take advantage of Alex's sniping abilities, building on the scene in Episode 1, where the player can punt boards off windows to give her a better view of attacking zombies. 
Here, we have the player removing tin roof panels to give Alex a line of sight into the room below. As much as possible, we try to create small surprises for the player that aren't related to combat at all. With this forklift puzzle, we wanted to trick the player into assuming that once they operated the lift, the puzzle would be solved. However, the player soon realizes that the obvious solution is actually a bit of misdirection. In previous versions of this level, the platform opened directly into this pit of toxic waste. Playtesters who didn't recognize the waste as something harmful would jump straight into the pit. We changed the path so the player could make a safe landing and slowly come to understand the toxic threat. We always look for opportunities to add narrative touches in our levels. The idea behind this chair, the submachine gun, and the beer bottles is that someone used to sit here, drink beer, and drop grenades into the pit of zombies. We give the player the opportunity to reenact this experience by giving out unlimited grenades and spawning zombies as soon as the player reaches this spot. Although this bridge is not the first occasion for cinematic physics in the episode, it was the original test subject we used to develop our effects. In early prototypes, the bridge started off in its broken position. It was a static object the player had to navigate to retrieve the car. When we incorporated the cinematic physics, we thought this bridge would be a great opportunity for players to see an immense piece of the environment transform before their eyes. The bridge collapse not only showcases the cinematic physics, it reminds players of the growing threat from the super portal and sets up a navigational puzzle they must use the car to solve. The original episode 2 vehicle was dubbed the Jalopy, which says something about how uncool it was. Early feedback was that it seemed too similar to the Half-Life 2 buggy. So we decided to redesign it so that players would feel excited rather than disappointed when they saw the car. Alex's original line when she first saw the jalopy echoed the feelings of many early viewers. What a wreck. Forget about White Forest. We'll be lucky if we make it to the end of the block. Having decided that we were going to rely on a car to get to White Forest, we had to figure out how to get Alex into the vehicle. Games often accomplish this by moving their characters close to the vehicle and then teleporting them inside in a very visible and jarring manner. We knew this would ruin Alex's believability as a character, so she had to smoothly get into a vehicle the way you would expect a person to in real life. This was no small task, given all the strange angles and positions the player could work the vehicle into. Alex also needed multiple entries into a vehicle, given that the doorway she wanted to use could be blocked or otherwise inaccessible. This also provided interesting moments for Alex, where she could vault over the hood of the vehicle in a very heroic fashion. The interaction between her and the vehicle was intriguing just by itself. Once we were sure she could enter and exit the vehicle convincingly, we then had the task of making her believable as she sat next to you. Our first experiments revolved around Alex reacting to the physical nature of the vehicle. When it crashed into a wall, she needed to be jolted. When you went around a bend, she needed to lean with the momentum of the car. These details were crucial in making her feel like she was really going along for the bumpy ride with you. We also wanted her to be very aware of her surroundings and what the player was doing while in the vehicle. If you ran over a zombie, she needed to echo the internal reward the player felt for accomplishing the feat. If you were about to hit the wall, we wanted her to flinch and react to the impending collision much as the player at home would be doing. There was a fine balance between making her too much of a backseat driver or having her be too quiet next to you. Ultimately, we wanted Alex's presence in the vehicle to seem so natural that players would never consider it anything other than normal. I don't think I really got the full scope of what Alex Vance is or how she's created until the first time that I went to Valve headquarters. And what was really important was that I got a better idea of how big the team was. I mean, a lot of people work really hard to make Alex Vance who she is. And, uh, I mean, you hear my voice and, you know, it's easy to say, oh, that's, that's Alex or Jamil is Alex, but that is so not the case. These people spend hours in front of their computer <laughs> or writing their scripts or dreaming up this beautiful person. And it, it really just... I'm just the cake topping, really. 